Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Hydrocephalus can affect anyone at any age, but it is most common in infants and older adults. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes reports an estimated one to two of every 1,000 babies are born with hydrocephalus. Jake Daniels is passionate about bringing awareness to this and how you can help these kids. And we are pleased to have Jake joining us here in the studio. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. I think the first question is, what is hydrocephalus all about? And, and again, why are you passionate about this? Well, it's, um, as you mentioned, a, a, a very common disease. You know, one in 750, one, uh, uh, babies are affected by this, which is... Yeah, I've always heard of it, but yeah, I really didn't know much about it. It's yeah. a tremendous amount. I mean, that, I, the way I look at it is, you know, every basically a large high school class would have at least one person that's affected by it. And what it is, it's a, um, it's a brain disease that affects um, what stands for, hydrocephalus stands for water, or hydro is water, and cephalus is uh, the, the brain or the head. So it means uh, effect, effectively water on, on the brain. So um, what it does is it creates swelling which then causes a multitude of other issues. And to solve this they inject what's called a shunt to try to release this mm -hmm. fluid and it affects these kids for a long period of time. So it's a very serious thing and um, something that I'm learning more about and um, never knew much about before and think but, that it's an important thing to But why spend. did you get interested or why what's your passion about it? I mean you Well I, w I have really good friends that grew up in the St. Croix Valley that I grew up with in uh, school and elementary school all the way up into we went to college in Duluth and my my friend's son was born with this disease and when it happened, we'd never heard about it. All we heard was brain surgery and how scary it was. And once we learned more about it, um, we realized that we needed to raise attention for it. Uh, and uh, my, my friends and, and I kind of came up with a really cool way to raise awareness for this. So, uh, Tell us a little bit more about <laughs> your, the, this little special boy. Well. And, uh, his name's Dean. We call him Dean the Machine. And with I this, love it. <laughs> with this disease, you know, every kid has a number. So we meet these kids all over, and they they have a number, and that number is how many brain surgeries they've oh had. Oh my gosh! And it's um, we met a young lady. She was 17 or 18, and she'd had like a hundred brain surgeries. Every time they have to um, adjust this shunt, it becomes a brain surgery. So Dean has, he's a great kid, bright as heck. Um, he's a, a, a bundle of energy. I mean, the, the potential is limit, limitless for this kid. His dad is very creative, his mom's amazing, and they've just done so well with this kid. But he's affected by this disease, which has affected him, and he had to grow up really fast with multiple brain surgeries and everything else. So. Uh, as, as, a, as a catalyst from that, we've uh, started raising awareness by doing a bunch of crazy stuff, and we're, we're pretty happy with where we're headed in that direction. And so. you are racing for a cure. Tell us about that, and how are you involved with yeah, that? Yeah, I'm kind of burying the lead, I guess. <laughs> we're, um, no, we're, so Bennett, uh, Dean's uh, father, is... Um, well, he's very creative and uh, very full energy. So to raise awareness, he's always been interested in these endurance race events. So to raise awareness for hydrocephalus, he decided to turn their old minivan, a Honda Odyssey, like an early 2000s minivan. Grocery and it still good. runs. Oh yeah, it's still, that, I think that was the, ca the thing. He, it was starting to break down so that was his excuse. I think one day it just eventually like disappeared and his wife was wondering where the minivan was. She got a new brand new SUV, mm -hmm. but uh, Bennett decided to use this as, uh, as a project. Anyways, we've turned it into an endurance race van and we go all over the country raising awareness in this van. Um, so we turned their minivan into a race van. It's stripped of all the weight. It has racing seats and suspension. They painted it black and has the hydrocephalus logo. It's 
pretty And I've seen pictures you're involved with it. You're taking part in it. Yeah, I'm probably the best racer on the team. No, <laughs> really? No, no, we have a team of racers, <laughs> so we jokingly, we have a good rapport with the group of guys. But it's an endurance, so you, you, you switch out racers because you have to go for long periods of time. Um, and you see how many laps you can get in this event, and you compete against other vehicles. So I'm one of the racers. Yeah. analogy with the endurance and, and these kids having to endure the condition and stuff and oh always having to um, survive it. I, I know that you, there's a, a walk to end um, hydrocephalus, and they're around the country. Why don't you tell us quickly about the walks? And, and I think there's one that has been here, here in uh, Minnesota in October or something like that. Yes, the they're all... The, the Hydrocephalus Association is great. They're the, the biggest private organization that raises money for this, and they do these walks all over the country. Our buddies have a, a place out in New York, and they uh, com uh, compete. They um, participate in those out east a bunch. But the one here in Minnesota, it's the uh, Twin Cities and to walk uh, Hydrocephalus. And um, it, it fluctuates around, and it's a great way to raise awareness. Uh, a bunch of folks get together. We brought the race fan out there, dressed up in our race suits, and participated. Cool. But it's a good way to raise awareness for it as well. So. Well, I'm afraid we're all out of time, but people, sure. for more information, can go to the the, the address on the screen, the Hydro... Um, hydro Association. It's abbreviated. So Hydro A-S-S-O-C, Hydro Association. Dot com, or dot org, I should say, hydroassoc.org uh, is great. And then our hydro race is for our racing event.org. So hydrorace.org is also right. fun to see some of the pictures of the whole gang and, and all that as well. What so. a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. And thank you for what you're doing. And that's wonderful. So thank you. Thanks so for much. having us. Really a pleasure. All right. So, thanks, Jake. Up next, we're talking about keeping our water safe and healthy in Minnesota. Stay with us started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. The new federal infrastructure bill includes $689 million for Minnesota's infrastructure upgrades to improve wastewater discharge and our drinking water. Here is a special regional Emmy Award winning video about water here in Minnesota. I believe that water is the oil of our century. We have seen whole civilizations perish if they were not able to sustain the land that they lived on. It's a struggle, and for people in general, I think sometimes we are more about the moment. We have to be a little forward thinking on this issue. I tend to believe that water conservation is something that's important for not just the U.S., but everywhere else, especially having grown up in India. <laughs> and in the community that we lived in, there was never a scarcity for water, but it was always on top of mind that it is a finite resource. We would get water for about six to eight hours on a given day. So it was very important for us to know how much we need, what we need it for, and what amount of excess do we have if we wanted to involve in some water play. You know, when you come over here, people kind of take it for granted without knowing how the rest of the world is dealing with water shortage. So it's become a discipline. I use water to wash my hands. I use water for doing the dishes. I use water to brush my teeth. I like to use water for fishing. I use water for bathing. I like using water for paddleboarding. I like using water for drinking. And then obviously to irrigate our lawns.
Water is an incredibly complex topic and people don't think about how incredibly complex it is. 75% of the population of Minnesota drinks from the aquifer, from the groundwater. An aquifer is, basically you could think about it as the ground that has the ability to yield water. So underneath us, where we're standing, are layers of sand and gravel, there's layers of clay, and then there's these layers of bedrock. And the bedrock is all fractured because it's been moving with tectonic shifts. And that's where the water resides. So that means we're in essence mining water out of the, out of the ground. So long term, if we are using too much water, well at some point it's not a sustainable system. Aquifer recharge is terminology used to describe how water gets back into the aquifer. In nature, this recharge takes place through precipitation, snow melt, rain events, and over many years, the water, as it hits the ground surface, percolates down through the varying types of rocks into the aquifer. As we know, we are a growing region, and we are adding more people. We have four main state agencies that deal with water. It's so complex that you need a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise. Department of Health is the only one that does drinking water quality. The Pollution Control Agency does pollution control and quality that way. And Irrigation and the Department of Ag does also quality. The Department of Natural Resources is the only state agency that deals with water quantity. So an observation well is a pipe in the ground that we can use to measure water levels. And we put a pipe down into the ground until we've got it into the water. And then we can put a measuring device down into the water. Drop this down and wait for the beep. 43.50. This logger is recording groundwater level and temperature in degrees Celsius. Measuring the levels of water in the aquifers is really important so that we know how things are changing over time. When we talk about water conservation, there are really two factors we need to think about. One relates to how much water do we have available, and the other thing is what is the quality of that water. The MPCA works closely with all of the cities to make sure that cities' stormwater is compliant with the permit conditions that are designed to protect downstream uses, whether that's in groundwater or surface water. If cities and state government were not paying attention to water quality and people didn't do their part, water quality in the state would no longer be suitable for drinking water, for recreation in and on the water, swimming and fishing. And I think the very integrity and identity that people feel associated with water would be in jeopardy. Another key to preserving water quality is treating wastewater that comes from the daily use. In the seven county region alone, the Met Council treats about 250 million gallons of wastewater a day, helping to protect the quality of our water, the environment, and the public health. The clean water is retained to the environment for people to use and enjoy over and over again. If you think about what contaminates groundwater, well, it's the same things that can contaminate the surface waters. It's chemicals that we put on our lawns in terms of fertilizers and pesticides. It's salts on our driveways and our sidewalks. Think about on your driveway, do you really need salt or would a little extra muscle do the job? Because salt, once it gets into the water, we don't get it out. And over time, that can make that water undrinkable.
The Minnesota Department of Health helps public water systems protect drinking water in a, in a variety of different ways. But in general, what we're looking to do is to help systems inventory the potential sources of contamination in those areas, minimize the likelihood that those potential sources of contamination become real sources and affect the drinking water supply. Nobody wants to see that happen. One of the challenges that we, that we face when we're managing water resources across the state of Minnesota is the wide range of different land uses. And in particular, as those land uses change, for example, as the urban environment grows and begins to uh, expand into what used to be agricultural areas, the kinds of potential sources of contamination change. The Department of Agriculture looks at farmers and irrigation and how they're using water and making sure that the farmers are doing best practices with water. Over 95% of the crops in Minnesota is not being irrigated other than what comes through rainfall or snowfall that is melts in the spring that then recharges the amount of water that's in the soil. We are in a situation that we are seeing increasing levels of rainfall across the year. A negative consequence of this new rainfall pattern is that when the water runs off the field, it carries soil with it all those nutrients in that soil then ends up in streams and rivers or lakes where we don't want that soil to be and we don't want nutrients to be. Another practice farmers have implemented is installing buffers along waterways uh, throughout the state. Those buffers are intended to filter water that might be moving through surface runoff from the field towards a waterway and to remove nutrients and soil from that water. Most farmers who irrigate have switched to irrigation systems that are using what is called low-pressure nozzles. Those systems are more efficient and uses less energy compared to uh, previous irrigation systems. Water doesn't follow the political boundaries, and we share all the resources. Opposed. Our role specifically is to provide technical and financial assistance to community to leverage their resources in order to support them to do a good job about how they can maintain their water supplies and also to sustain their water supplies for as long as they are provided to their residents. Met Council also is responsible for developing a master water supply plan the main goal of that water supply plan is to have affordable, safe water supplies that's sustainable for current and future generations. Water conservation is one of the easiest ways of, for municipalities so that they can meet their future water demand. I love the water. I think everybody should spend time down by the water. I think that's the most healing thing that you can possibly do. Without clean water, you can't drink it, animals can't live in it, plants can't grow in it. It's the whole basic, I think, of all of conservation in general on the planet. Right now, we are a city of about 72,000 residents. We know by the year 2040, we're gonna to grow to nearly 90,000 residents. So we would like to do our part in conservation. And as we grow that population, that we will not use any more water than we're using today. One of the biggest steps the city is to overcome the obstacle of water supply is working with both our residential customers and our commercial customers on water conservation. During the brewing process, we will use around 600 to 700 gallons of water. I filter my water with reverse osmosis, so that's an expensive process. So the water I'm using is more expensive than the water that you would use in your home. So I need to save as much of it as I can. 
our grain goes to a farmer, our used grain, so we don't dump that in the trash. We recycle everything we can, uh, so that doesn't go into landfills like that. All of that benefits the ecology, sure, but it really is smart business sense. I put the numbers to it, and I'm saving a ton of money by being conscious about conserving and recycling. Irrigation is one of the top water users. In fact, in the summer, our water use is sometimes four times that in the winter months. You know, one of the most effective programs we've had is the new irrigation controllers that we've provided. So for a very reasonable cost, we will provide an irrigation controller that meets all the modern technical capabilities and provide it to a home so that a homeowner can better control their irrigation use. The Park and Recs Department helps develop programs for the youth in our community. We teach students through these parks and summer rec programs what an aquifer is. These types of programs we find are very beneficial to help educate our residents, children specifically. All those types of things that we do help message the importance of efficient use of water and the benefits of that. Pollinator-friendly landscapes are important because they provide nutrients to local pollinators, birds, butterflies, bees. The native plants that we have here in Minnesota typically have really deep growing roots, so they need less water because they can access water in times where we don't get it from the sky because they can reach further and get down and get it. Sustainable landscapes are typically less maintenance. They require less resources to establish and keep them going. We don't want to be overwatering our landscapes and then be hit with a really big rainstorm and have all that runoff and impact our surface waters. So it's really important that everyone does what they can with the landscape that they have to provide deep growing roots for our groundwater and our aquifer and our surface waters. If we're all chipping in and doing our part, we'll have a better environment throughout the city. The city really needs water to be able to allow it to thrive and to grow. Businesses need water for manufacturing and processing. That brings with it jobs. That really brings added value to the community with that economic investment. But it also means that we wouldn't necessarily see as much growth in the residential housing market. And we know that that is really important to the city to have a thriving opportunity for housing. When the city of Cottage Grove built the City Hall Public Safety Building a few years back, one of the things that we wanted to talk about specifically was, was sustainability. And one of the things that we did in, in discussing sustainability is we created a cistern system here at City Hall that deals with collecting rainwater and then reusing it for irrigation purposes. We want to lead by example as a, as a community. So that's one of the things that we did here in Cottage Grove. The population of St. Paul Park is about 5,700 right now. The city does try to invest in communication to our residents for water conservation. We do, of course, have the odd even water rules and we do ask residents to water after dark and in the early morning hours because of evaporation that would take place during the day. Water conservation is a very easy way for all the communities to do in the future so that they can secure longer, sustainable, resilient water supplies. And it can start with very small actions. You can find a piece of this stuff together. Three, two runners will go, pitch it. And a diving play up the middle by Josh Allen. Well, CHS Field, the first thing you have to realize is that ballparks, any professional sports stadiums, are environmental hogs. They're horrible abusers of natural resources, and water's no exception. Lays out and makes the grab! One of the pillars on which the ballpark was designed and constructed is sustainability. The water conservation technology that we're using here in the ballpark, there are a lot of tree trenches and different drains, rain gardens, things like that that take the runoff that comes from just a regular rainstorm so that it's being clean basically as it leaves the pavement before it ends up leaving our place and going out to the sewer system. 
We have a rainwater harvesting system that takes the rain from our neighbor's roof into a 27,000 gallon cistern and the water is cleaned basically three or four times and then we're able to repurpose it in two different areas. I'm irrigating the field and we also flush toilets in one of the concession buildings. We offset probably close to half a million gallons a year that we ordinarily would take off the city's water system. So we take a lot of pride in it. It takes a lot of work, but it's critical to us. Being a public facility, that we're managing it to, to the highest standards and the best standards. So that's really what's behind our efforts here. We, we want to be good stewards and good neighbors. Here's a shot driven into deep left by Max Murphy at the wall. It's gone. You want to take this down by the strawberries? Yes. I think water conservation is important for everybody to take a part in. In terms of our garden, we make sure that we water at the base of the plants, and this is something that's even been instilled in my young children. They know not to water on top of the leaves. Um, we have mulch in our flower beds and newspaper covering some of the dirt in our food garden as well, just to prevent evaporation. And we do have a rain barrel, and so we are able to collect water in that. So when we prepare our strawberry beds for the winter every year, we use straw or hay to cover up the bed. It protects it from the cold weather in the winter, but then in the spring when we remove the straw, we actually leave it in between where the plants are because that prevents water evaporation as well. And it also serves the dual purpose of preventing weed growth. There we go. Teaching water conservation to not only my children, but children everywhere in the community is super important because they are the ones that are inheriting the earth that we're giving them. And so we need to teach them at a very young age that it's important. We don't feel like we have a water problem in Minnesota because, you know, we're 10,000 lakes, it rains okay, it's relatively green up here, but the bottom line is it is our most precious resource, more than, far and away more than any other one. Every little bit helps so that we have every drop of water that we can. Some of the ways we conserve water in our daily lives is to make sure that we use it for what we actually need. So when it comes to washing my hands, when I put the soap on my hands, I don't actually turn on the water yet. And then once it comes to actually rinsing it, that's when I use the water. I'd say, especially when washing the dishes, I think a lot of people let the water run the entire time. I try to be mindful of just using the water that I need to actually accomplish the task. Uh, another way I conserve water is just not letting it run while I'm brushing my teeth. Probably one of the biggest conservations, uh, we try to have higher efficiency faucets or higher efficiency appliances that don't use and waste as much and not taking showers or baths that are hours long but kind of getting business done and then getting in and getting out. We use a rain bale to save water. We don't irrigate our lawn constantly. We use a smart system to make sure that we only irrigate the water when we need it. So those are some of the ways. It's by way water is connecting us all, and it's very important for all of us to do our part in protecting and also ensure that we have sustainable water supplies for us now and our kids into the future. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you in the new year, everyone. Stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.